videos and watch my channel for any amount of time, you've probably already noticed that I'm a huge fan of bootleg and clone consoles and basically just any sort of weird, strange, obsolete hardware. And recently, I was lucky enough to find this thing here. This is a Mega Drive clone, and this particular one's called a Magic 2. <laughs> and some of you might know this particular clone by a different name, some of you might recognise this as a Scorpion 16. And again, some of you may or may not be aware of a, a TV programme from here in the UK back in the 90s called Bad Influence. And Bad Influence, if you don't know, was like a children's TV programme where they, they did video game reviews, console reviews and technology, all that sort of thing. I was a huge fan of it. I used to really enjoy coming home from school and, and watching and seeing the, the latest video games that were coming out and, and all that kind of good stuff. But one day they had a segment on this clone console and it was called the Scorpion 16. It was basically the same as this thing here that was just branded differently but they had the presenters come out there was like I think it was Andy Crane and Violet Berlin and they did like a whole two minute segment on this pirate console telling you where you could buy it and all the different features it had and everything. Uh, I believe they were saying that you could buy it in a toy store called Beaties and Beaties was like a properly legit toy store. Um, they sold real Mega Drives and they also sold this clone console as well. I think this was actually cheaper than the real thing and in some ways, or in quite a lot of ways actually, it was even better than the, the official console. It could play games from different regions and it was fully compatible with your Mega CD and everything like that as well. But not surprisingly it got pulled from sale pretty quickly after I suppose Sega clocked what was going on and weren't too happy about it. But the really interesting thing about this particular clone is the fact it's a true hardware clone and what I mean by that is it's not emulated software, it's not like a, a console and a chip, it's actually a one-to-one -one hardware clone, it has a lot of the same components that you'd find in the real uh, console, it's got the same CPU, uh, sound chip and everything like that and in this video what I thought I'd do is take this thing apart and actually give you a look at what's going on inside this because to me this is really, really interesting and uh, I really like getting my different clones and, and taking a look at them but this is uh, particularly fascinating to me. If you think about it, this was available at the same time as the real thing uh, and it was like a, a true hardware clone and it was cheaper than the, the, the real console. So yeah, what I thought I'd do is take this thing apart and give you a closer look at it and maybe show you it working with a, a few of the uh, accessories and uh, showing you running some real games. I'll leave a link to that Bad Influence video in the description below and you can check it out for yourself but I highly recommend watching it because it's just entertaining to see a couple of TV presenters, like legit TV presenters trying to tell you that you should go out and buy this pirate console but whatever. This particular version like I said is branded as the Magic 2 and I have seen a few different variants of this particular clone. There's the Scorpion 16 and there's the Magic 2. I think there was another one I remember seeing on a forum a while back called the Atos possibly. But this one here is the Magic 2. The only real cosmetic difference is this little badge in front of the, the system. And uh, there are a couple of hardware differences but I'll, I'll get to those in a moment. But as you can see it says Magic 2 here and it's got a little... Uh, literally the only writing in the box is this little a bit of blurb here. The stunning graphics and dramatic action of 16-bit arcade hits can be yours with magic. And that's it. There's absolutely nothing else on here telling you who made the console, where it came from. It doesn't even tell you what country it was made in or anything. It says 16-bit here and here you've got this sticker that says Universal Cartridge System. And you'll find that this sticker is on pretty much all the variants of this particular console. So that's something to look for, I suppose, uh, if you're trying to find one of these things. But here's the box that came in. I've got the console here, obviously. But this is the, the extras you get with it. Um, you get uh, a single piece of paper with the, the instructions printed out on it. And I'll quickly scan over this. You can pause it if you want. You want to see what this is all about. It's just basically telling you how to uh, switch the different regions and uh, warning you if you don't turn off the system while changing switches you could damage your console. And the instructions were done by someone called Gary Smoke uh, and that's literally all you get with the, the console. That is 
that is it. Doesn't like I said, doesn't tell you where the console was made or uh, have any contact details or anything on it. Just one single piece of paper uh, from Mr. Gary Smoke there, whoever he is. And you get a couple of console uh, console. You get a couple of controllers with this. Uh, these are probably the worst controllers I've ever seen. Um, it's difficult to explain how these feel. They they feel like the cheapest plastic you've you've ever encountered, and they are just they are nasty. Um, you can hear the whole thing rattles. The D-pad feels like utter crap. Uh, on the back though, it does have a, a turbo on-off switch, which is uh, particularly useless, but whatever. So you get two of them. Here you get your power adapter. Nothing too fancy there. I'd imagine this would work with the, the official Mega Drive. I just use the official uh, adapter to power mine. And you get a, an RF uh, connector here, and also a little switch box your RF. And that's that's all you get in the box. If we take a look at the system itself, you can see I've got it side by side here with the real thing. And the first thing you'll notice is that it's actually quite a bit smaller than the, the real console. It's got a smaller footprint and it's actually got a, a lower profile as well. So I suppose you could consider that to be an advantage over the real thing. It's uh, going to take up less room on your shelf and basically does the exact same thing. But other than that, you can see they also have taken similar design accents over onto the clone here. You've got the disc with the 16-bit, the same as the real thing. Your vents, your volume slider for your headphones and your on-off and your reset, just the same as what you've got with the, the real Sega hardware. But other than that, I think it looks pretty good. It's a much simpler design. Obviously it doesn't look quite as nice, but overall it, it's a bare-bones uh, looking system and it does the job and I think it actually looks quite nice. Just like the original hardware, the clone also has a 3.5mm audio jack on the front and that outputs your stereo audio, your left and your right channels. And again, just like the original, you've got a volume slider here for adjusting the, the headphones. You have your power and your reset buttons. And the power button's a, a clicky type of on-off button and the reset is just a, a momentary push type of button there. Here you've got your red LED to tell you when the console is switched on or off and on the front you have your controller 1 and controller 2 and this just takes your standard Mega Drive controllers. Around the back of the console you've got your power and your audio video connectors and it just uses a standard DC input. You can use the official Sega power supply if you want. It's got an RF output and here the interesting thing about the clone is instead of having a 9 pin audio video connector like you'd find in the real thing. It's got a composite video actually built into the system itself which would have been probably quite a big advantage back in the, the 90s when most people were just using the, the RF output there. Uh, so to have a, a built-in composite video is, is probably quite a nice thing to have back then. And, and then you've got your, your audio output here as well. The thing with the audio output is because you've only got the one I'm guessing that the left and the right channel are both being pushed through that. Um, to hook this up and still get stereo sound, what I've been doing is using one of these things here. So you've got your 3.5mm jack and it just splits into left and right. So you can just plug it into the, the front audio jack there and then off to your TV. Um, the only downside to this is because it doesn't have the 9 pin uh, AV socket, it, it doesn't output a, an RGB signal. So you can't use it with RGB SCART, but I have read that you can actually modify these. Uh, it's not something I'm <laughs> going to be doing anytime soon because obviously I use the uh, the real Mega Drive for that anyway. But back in the 90s, I think having a, a built-in composite video output would have probably been uh, quite an, a, a nice advantage to have. Because you didn't need to use the proprietary Mega Drive cables or anything. You can just plug this directly into your TV. Along the side here you have your expansion port and surprisingly enough you can use this with a Mega CD if you want. You can see you've got your edge connector there. It's a bit dirty but it does work. And the other thing, and I'll show you the, the key on the, the side of the port here, it's actually got little switches in that expansion bay that let you switch between NTSC and PAL. So 50-60 Hz 
and over here you've got a, a choice between Mega Drive and uh, Sega Genesis. So basically the English or the, the Japanese language modes. Uh, on this side here, the sticker again says Universal Cartridge System, same as what it had on the uh, the box. And if you look in here, you can just about make out the, the switches. They're quite difficult to reach, but you can you can get to them. There's one there, and then there's one there. And I'll take a closer look at those when I take this apart in a moment. But the big feature and the big difference between the, the clone console and the uh, the official Mega Drive is hidden underneath this panel here. If I just unclip the panel from the bottom of the console here and remove it, it'll come away to reveal a hidden void underneath the motherboard. And if you've already seen that Bad Influence episode that I was talking about earlier, then you know exactly what this is for. But basically, the main or the key selling feature that the clone had over the original Mega Drive was the fact that you could choose any game you want to be installed into the system itself. So what you do is you'd get your game, this cartridge here. The cartridge itself wouldn't fit into that, uh, that void. So what you need to do is remove the screws here and just take the PCB out of here and plug it in. Then you'd put your cover back on and provided there wasn't any game in the, the top slot here, it would just default to whatever was plugged into the, the system here. So that was a really cool feature to have. I mean, nowadays that would be uh, useful if you maybe wanted to use it with an EverDrive, you could just put all your games onto an EverDrive and stick it in here and leave the top slot empty. You could use that for your, your real games whenever you wanted to play them. Um, unfortunately with this particular revision of the clone they seem to have not bothered to install the second uh, card edge connector for the, the carts. So you can see along here that there is a space for it I can show you that there. It's just not populated. And I was thinking about installing uh, an edge connector in there, but I don't know how I'd manage to find the, the particular part for it. Unfortunately, I can't just get a, a parts board, uh, a parts Mega Drive, and desolder the, the, the connector from one of these because it's at the wrong angle. It would be pointing straight up, and you want it uh, running parallel with the, the motherboard here. So I don't know where I'd find that. And to be honest, I don't really want to tamper with this anyway. I quite like to have it just as it is, because it is quite an unusual piece of hardware. But very interesting feature to have on a clone system. All the same, just to have a hidden panel on the bottom of the, the system where you can actually install a game permanently, or well not permanently, semi-permanently, into the, the system itself. So again, another advantage that the clone had over the, the original Mega Drive. The thing I find most fascinating about the console is the fact that it's a true hardware clone and what I mean by that is it uses a lot of the same components that you'd find in the real Mega Drive. And If I just pop the top off here you can get a quick glimpse of what's going on in there and I'll take a closer look in just a moment but what I mean by a, a true hardware clone is that it it's not emulating any of the, uh, the original console in any way. It's got its own hardware and it processes all the software on real hardware. And I've got a couple of examples of different types of clone here just to uh, better explain what I'm talking about. The first one here is the Game Box, which I've shown in a previous video. This is a Game Boy Advance clone. And despite the fact that it's got a cartridge slot here where you can plug in your real games and play them on this, it it's really just a... I suppose it's like a miniature computer that's running its own operating system and it's running a, a, like an emulator. The games are being emulated really. There's no true hardware, there's no true Game Boy Advance hardware in this, it's all emulated. So that's the first example there. The second example I've got here is another Mega Drive clone. This one's been made to look more like the Model 2 Japanese version of the console. And this is sort of what I'd consider to be like a, a hybrid. It's not quite the same as a software based clone and it's not the same as a true hardware clone either. It's kind of in between. And what I mean by that is if I just pop the top off here you can see what's going on inside. And there's not really a whole lot in here. There's just this main board in the middle. You've got a couple of daughter boards here with the controller ports and the, the AV and the power. But really, the entire console is based around this one chip in the middle. And that's the SM801. And what that is, is more or less a Mega Drive on a chip. 
what that chip does is it emulates the hardware of the real system and the quality of the games running on that are quite similar to what you'd find on a software based emulator. You're not going to have full compatibility, you might get slowed down and glitches uh, and it's not really the, the best solution. You also don't have the likes of your edge connector here so you couldn't use something like this with a, a Mega CD or Sega CD um, and I know even if you've got the, the original game some of them just will not play with the likes of this here. You get these in different versions, you get like um, a Nintendo version, they're more commonly known as Fami clones, but this particular one is a Mega Drive one. You see the SM801. And finally, back to the clone console. So brace yourself because I'm going to give you some circuit board porn or some PCB porn and let you see exactly what's going on in the motherboard and why I think this thing is so impressive. I'll just pop the lid off here and you can get a good view of the board. And the first thing I'll show you here is right in the middle. And that's the CPU. It uses a Motorola MC68000, which is exactly the same type that you'll find in the real console. Over here you've got your sound processor, which is a Z80 CPU. And again, this is the same type that you'll find in the real console. You commonly find these as well in the likes of Neo Geo uh, arcade boards as well. Here you have some, I believe this is some RAM for the sound. Uh, this chip here, this is IC number 11. Um, this on the real console I think is a Yamaha 2612 and it's the, the sound chip. But here for whatever reason they've used their own version of that, like a bootleg version of the, the Yamaha chip. Why they've done that? I'm not too sure, it was maybe just to cut down on costs, I don't know, but that there should really be a, a YM2612, I think. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong there. Uh, these two chips here on the real console are Sega proprietary ICs. I'm not entirely sure what they do, uh, but on this particular clone they've used their own uh, bootleg versions of those. And it's interesting to note the uh, the labelling of these bootleg chips, you've got SC95, uh, this one's SC94 and this is 93 and then again you've got the labelling JDBD on this one, this is JDBG and JDBA. don't really know what any of that means but it's interesting to know anyway. These are the three uh, bootleg uh, unofficial chips that I've found on this board so far. Everything else seems to be pretty much off the shelf. Uh, good quality components. Down here you've got your oscillator, your uh, your clock 53.693175 megahertz and I believe that might be, um, that's going to be 50-50 chance of me getting this right, I believe that's maybe faster than the, the original one, I don't know, but it's certainly not the same clock speed as the one you'll find on the official console. Here, again, just like the, the real console, you have your 3.5mm jack on a little uh, like a little daughter board there attached to the motherboard so it's separate. And you've got some gold star, I think those are RAM chips here. You've got your, um, your volume slider, just like with the, the regular console there. Under here, you won't be able to see that probably too well, maybe if I zoom in, you can see, or you can't. You've got a Sony CX-A1634P, I think that is the, uh, the sound chip, uh, as in for the sound circuitry to amplify it. Um, again, I'm not too sure on that. Uh, back here you've got your RF modulator and your composite video out. And here we have what I believe to be the... I'm just steady my camera, hang on. The, video processor and that's a Sony AX1145P. Again I think that's the same one that you'll find in the official console and if I'm correct in thinking that I can actually pull RGB signals from this and that would then allow me to install a, a special cable that would let this be compatible with the 32X because as it is at the moment uh, obviously there's no RGB output for plugging into the 32X, so it's not compatible as it is, but if I can pull RGB off of this here, then I can just make a little uh, cable. There's, a, there's even a, a space on the, the casing here where I could just uh, quite easily 
pop something out of there and that would allow me to plug in a 32X and it should be compatible. I don't see any reason why it won't but that's maybe something I'll, I'll check in the future. Over here you've got another couple of, these look like RAM, these are Hitachi chips and they've been mounted on these uh, these adapter boards, I'm not too sure why they've done that, again it's probably just cost saving. Uh, there's a, another crystal here and if I can just zoom in on the, the speed of that, you've got a 4.433619 megahertz crystal. Not too sure what that's for. This might be something to do with it being a, a PAL specific console, but uh, again, I'm not too sure. Um, here you've got your edge connector, which I showed previously. The board is marked as 501IIUCS. Uh, uh, or two, and here you have your switches that allow you to switch between the uh, the NTSC and PAL modes. That's your language. You can see the the blue cables here come over to, or one of them comes over to a jumper just here, and the other one it just goes onto a contact on the the board there, and that's uh, the the board. That's the motherboard of the clone console. Very, very impressive stuff. Um, mostly the same components that you'll find in the real console. And like I said before, there's no software. Um, it's not like it's any of the software is being emulated. It's all running on proper hardware. And overall, the build quality of this thing is, is excellent. Uh, definitely not what you'd expect to find in your typical clone console. You can see that there. It's all nicely put together and the thing that really impresses me the most is, I mean, this was available at the same time as the real console, meaning that someone had to not only uh, reverse engineer the, the, co the Sega's console, they then went on to completely redesign the motherboard here and create something that had even more features than the official console. You've got your language switches and everything. Um, I know Sega probably didn't want to add that to the real console anyway, but you've you've got the secondary uh, secondary cartridge slot, which you can see the the solder points for there, which is underneath the motherboard. Uh, so they they did that, and they not only uh, completely redesigned the board, they made it smaller, and this was even cheaper and cheaper than the real console when it hit the market, and it was compatible. For the most part, obviously it's not compatible with the 32X, but at least as it is now. But I mean, that to me is just uh, kind of mind blowing. I can't imagine nowadays a, a company being able to do that with, say, the likes of your uh, PlayStation 3 or your Xbox. Uh, you just wouldn't see that. So, yeah, very impressive. But now what I'll show you is the console actually running some games and hooked up to the 32X, and you can see just exactly how good it is. I've got it all connected up to my Mega CD. I've got my patch cable here for the audio and round the back I've got my audio video cables and power all connected and ready to go. If I hit the power button here, fire it up, it should work no problem. And as you can see the lights all come on, the power LED on the top and you can probably already hear it but there's the menu screen or title screen whatever you want to call it. And just bear in mind, this is all going through the composite video cable, so it doesn't look that great. Usually I'd use RGB, but unfortunately there's no option for that with the uh, the clone at the moment. But otherwise it works great. It even works with the wireless adapter for the controller. So I'll just hook this in for now. So I can play the games. It doesn't work with the modem, sadly, so no online play, but oh well. Uh, hit the reset button there, the tray should open. Put a game in. So I've got a copy of Sonic CD Mega Mix, which is like the fan-made game. And I'll put that in. Get the controller here and just hit start. So as you can see, it works fine. And I'm just going to try and play this one-handed for a bit but it seems to not have any problems at all playing Mega CD games. Oh no, falling in the lava. Okay, 
Oh, I'm dead. But yeah, you get the idea. It works fine with Mega CD games. So next up, what I'll do is I'll try it with a couple of Mega Drive games. I've now got my PAL copy of Streets of Rage 2 in the console, and it works just fine, no problem at all. You can see that there. The only thing I have noticed is the system seems to be locked into a sort of a 50Hz PAL mode, and you can never get rid of the borders at the top and the bottom of the screen. Um, the other thing I've noticed is switching between the NTSC and the PAL settings here doesn't seem to affect it in the same way as it would with the likes of a real system that's been modded. The games don't speed up and slow down or anything like that, it just seems to always be in 50Hz mode. It plays games from every region, so it'll play all my Japanese games and you can switch the language as well, not a problem at all. But it doesn't speed the game up or get rid of the borders, which is a bit disappointing. I think it might have something to do with that crystal that's next to the video processor that I mentioned or noted earlier. Um, there's also a PAL sticker on the bottom of the console, so I'm guessing this was a, a region specific unit and you'd need to modify it to uh, get it out of that uh, 50 hertz mode. The other slight negative I've noticed is with the sound and although the sound is really high quality, I mean it's almost the same as the, uh, the real thing, there are some slight differences in the, the kind of the pitch and the tone of certain sound effects. For the most part, like 99% of the time, everything sounds exactly as it should. But there's just one or two sound effects that just sound a little off. And I'm wondering if that's got anything to do with the, uh, the non-Yamaha uh, chip they use, like the bootleg chip. But I'm guessing if you switched that out for the, the real thing, then it would work fine. But otherwise, uh, yeah, it is. Now and then I've noticed that just slightly off key, slightly uh, a strange tone to it, but otherwise, I mean, the sound quality is excellent. Uh, what I'll do now is I'll just quickly show you another game running here, I'll maybe show you one of the Japanese games in action. Like I said, it does play games from every region. I've got my copy of Bare Knuckle 3 in the system now, and as you can see, it works fine. It does have the borders at the bottom and the top of the screen, and if I just turn up the volume a bit, you may be able to hear the the difference in tempo. You can hear it's definitely a bit slower than it should be, it's playing in 50 hertz mode basically. So that's a bit disappointing, but again, it's maybe something you could potentially uh, mod back to 60 hertz. But it does play everything, so I mean that that's the, the main feature of the console, is that it can play games from every region and uh, yeah, you're not limited by what games you can play. Final thoughts, what do I think of the console? Overall, I'm very impressed with it. I think it's an amazing piece of hardware. It does have its negative points. I mean, it doesn't have that RGB output on the back, so you can use it with a 32X, at least not straight out of the box anyway. It doesn't have the YM2612 sound chip on board, so sometimes the sound effects can be a little off, but I mean, otherwise the sound quality is pretty much as good as the real thing, and it's definitely better than any other clone that I've used, or even some of the emulators that you get on PC, it's still better than that, so it does have that in its favour. The controllers that you get with it are pretty terrible, but I mean, you can use your own official Sega ones if, you, if you'd like. I think the pros far outstrip the cons, to be honest with this thing. I mean, it's smaller than the real hardware. It was cheaper at the time. I know that doesn't really uh, apply now, but it was cheaper than the real thing back in the day. It's got that secondary card slot. At least, well, this one doesn't, but you could have got that back in the, the day. It's got a composite video built into it, or video output built in, so you don't need to worry about using any proprietary Sega uh, cables. So you've got that in its favour. There's no emulation. It's got full game and hardware compatibility with official Sega hardware and games. Uh, it's really well built. I mean, the build quality in this thing is top notch, especially for a clone system or a bootleg. It's region free. You can play your games from Japan, the US, wherever. It'll play pretty much anything you, you throw at it. So it's got that again in its favor. And just to put it into perspective, this is a 20 year old clone console, bootleg console, and it's still working to this day, so I mean, if you put that in perspective, I mean how many consoles can you think of from legitimate manufacturers that have long since stopped working, and here you've got a, a bootleg system 20 years later, still running and doing exactly what it was designed for, so yeah, overall very impressed with it, and very happy to have it in the collection, but 
there you go, that's my review of the Scorpion 16, the Mega, or the Magic 2, sorry, whatever you want to call it. Um, I thought I should do a, a bit of a documentary on it, just because it's a bit of a strange uh, and obscure piece of hardware. And hopefully I've covered everything in this video. But thanks for watching, and I'll catch you again soon.